Hello, welcome to Share International Live, our free webinar series. This is the second webinar in the series, and we plan to present one every few weeks based on time and circumstances permitting. The overall series is called The Imperative of Change Towards a Sane and Just World. And we can all see, obviously, from looking at the world that change is needed. And that's what this series is about. What changes are needed and what are some of the possible solutions? This particular episode is called Sharing and Justice, the Essential Foundations for Peace. I'd like to introduce our panel for this discussion. Joining us from the Netherlands is Felicity Elliott. Felicity is chief editor of Share International Magazine, and she is stepping in as a substitute today for a colleague who couldn't join us. So we especially appreciate you being here with us today, Felicity, to help us out. Also on our panel is Sabina Qureshi in Canada. Sabina has worked as an English teacher in Norway and in Spain. Alexander Decker, also in the Netherlands, was born there and then lived in Africa and Asia as a child. He is now a psychotherapist in forensic addiction healthcare. Also with us today is Haley Moore, originally from New Zealand, now in the United States. And she also is a Share International volunteer. And she will be fielding your questions today and then presenting them to the panel a little bit later in the program. So please feel free to submit your, type in your questions um, as we go along uh, that are relevant to the topics that we're talking about. I'm Dick Larson, your host, and I'm also in the United States. As I said, we're all volunteers of SHARE International, a nonprofit organization. Now we will hear from our panel in just a moment, but first we said in our announcement for this event that we would be talking about sharing justice and peace within the context of the ageless wisdom teachings. So let me first give you a little thumbnail sketch of what the ageless wisdom teachings are about in case you don't know. And what I'm gonna say next is very important we do not ask you to believe what we say. We just ask that you try to keep an open mind and that can be challenging. <laughs> we ask you that you try to keep an open mind and see if any of this makes sense to you. The Angel's Wisdom teachings are a philosophy of life, not a religion. It's been passed down through the ages to humanity to help us understand more about life and about who we are and that we're spiritual beings having a human experience and that spirituality is in every aspect of life. More people are now becoming aware around the world of these ageless wisdom teachings, making this an even more interesting time to be alive. The teachings have been updated over the ages, mostly presented by people orally first and then in writing, the latest presenter was Benjamin Cram from London, who was the latest in a long line of presenters of the Ageless Wisdom. Benjamin Cram spoke about how 2,000 years, every 2,000 years or so, at the start of a new age or a new cosmic cycle, a great teacher comes to help humanity. He said the teacher for this age is here now in a physical body, waiting for the best time to come forward. He is the world teacher, and his personal name is Maitreya. My personal name is Dick. His personal name is Maitreya, which in Sanskrit means the joyful one, the one who brings joy. And he doesn't come alone, but with other senior members of our spiritual kingdom called the Masters of Wisdom. And they are here to make suggestions to us in every aspect of life on how we can straighten out this mess that we've made of our world. Now, we have free will, each of us does. So each of us needs to decide for ourselves 
how we will respond to these suggestions, whether we will act on them or not. Obviously, we are convinced that what we're telling you today is true, but we present it only for your consideration and information. Our information is that Maitreya comes as a teacher, not as a religious figure or to start a religion. He said that he comes for everyone, regardless of background or belief. So we hope that a little bit of what we have to say today resonates with you and makes sense to you. We're here to discuss the problems of life on this planet, especially peace, and some of the possible solutions that are suggested by the Ageless Wisdom teachings. Our goal is to give you a little hope in this life, a light at the end of this dark tunnel that we're in. Now it's time to hear from our panel. So let's start off with you, Felicity. Felicity, can you tell us what the Ageless Wisdom means when it talks about justice? Justice, yes. You know, our series is looking at all sorts of um, very important questions. It, you can see that Chair International doesn't shy away from looking at the, the questions, the ageless wisdom teachings, the um, eternal verities, the great truths. These all go to the heart of what we are as human beings and what we are collectively, what life means on our planet. Now, the smartest, wisest, most insightful minds on our planet uh, and you've just mentioned them, Maitreya, the world teacher and the masters, have put forward a number of um, ideas which we would be wise ourselves to, to take cognizance of. And one of those is justice, as you've talked about now. This whole series, we hope, as we go along, we'll explore with ourselves and with others um, notions such as rediscovering what we are and I think that many people in the world today are beginning to think and to experience a sense of themselves as part of one whole now when you have that as your basis that you're one one with each other that you're a part of a being a great being the idea of justice follows very easily from that because and Maitreya has said it himself, how can there be two worlds when there is one? There's one reality, there's the reality of humanity on one planet. We belong to each other, we're part of each other. So justice flows very easily from that. And what is justice? I think we all know it intuitively. You hear a very uh, small child saying, it's not fair, it's not fair, <laughs> because they register a sense of justice and it is an instinctual thing and humanity, if left to its own devices and not, a, and not uh, brainwashed or influenced by others, will automatically respond with kindness, with goodness, with love and with solidarity with others, which is the basis of justice. And justice simply means not in, I, I'm not talking about legal justice in this case. We're not talking about the judiciary or the legal system. We're talking about justice in the sense of a sense of respect, tolerance, fairness, equality, sharing, and all of those, those concepts, those principles, which are actually qualities which should imbue our lives. That's what we're talking about. So justice is a basis and is inextricably linked with ideas like sharing, equality, tolerance, peace. Justice is to me also about taking care of each other and treating each other well. Maitreya comes to teach right relationship, how we can be in right relationship with each other. And that's certainly also a big part of justice. Thank you, Felicity. Well, just as you were speaking, Felicity, what, what came to mind was the line from Shakespeare, uh, the quality of mercy is not strained. Uh, it follows from the heavens like a gentle rain. And what comes to, really, I think the reason it comes to mind is that when you talk about justice, as you were saying, it's not a legal justice we're talking about. And, and we're not talking about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Uh, we're talking about something that has mercy in it. We're talking about 
brotherhood, a sense of of fraternity and of connectedness with each other, as you were saying, feeling feeling like we're part of something together, uh, and and I feel like that's so essential, uh, and it's probably the the kernel, the seed of everything else, really, uh, that we want to talk about today. Sabina, we said we were going to talk about sharing, and I'm wondering if you could help us understand a little bit what Maitreya and the Masters mean when they talk about sharing? Well, my understanding is that when they talk about sharing, they're not referring to the type of thing we often think of, which is that an NGO or a charity is asking us to dip into our pocket and share what we have personally with the world or with a, a community somewhere who is in need, uh, but rather on a global scale. And so we have this quote from an article by Benjamin Krem's master, one of the masters of wisdom, who says, when men consider the principle of sharing, they almost always see it in personal terms. But in fact, the principle of sharing can only be organized as a global process. So really what he is saying and what the masters are saying is we have to think of ourselves as one humanity, and organize sharing at a global level. It's the only way this will really work. Uh, and that makes absolute sense. It's, it's kind of like with the coronavirus, what we're seeing now. You can't <laughs> just one area of the globe and expect that to be a solution. It has to be global. It has to include every part of the world. And, and sharing is the same. If we're going to make a change in the way we dispose of our resources, we have to do that across the board. Alexander, were you going to say something? I thought I heard your voice for a moment. No, no, I, I was agreeing. <laughs> okay. uh, well, let me ask you the next Sharing question. is essential right now. I mean, it's not just uh, because of COVID, but because of uh, the climate change, uh, because of all the things that are going on in the world economy. If we are to move beyond the crisis we're in, which is having more and more of an impact, then it's essential that we share with each other rather than keep on competing. Uh, you know, one country trying to buy up all the vaccines uh, as soon as possible, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. Alexander, and, and, do, you, do you think some people are worried about being forced to share? Yes, um, I'm quite sure that people uh, are afraid of that, at least some people, because uh, the world is, is in a state of unbalance and uh, in the rich part of the world, uh, obviously, we also tend to feel threatened in a way by what's going on. And we are afraid of losing our wealth. And uh, when the reality is becoming more and more clear through this crisis, that um, the only way we are build a sustainable economy, which also works for the planet, is by sharing, but not, um, you know, you don't have to hand in all your money uh, or we're not going to uh, set up a, a, a new communist uh, worldwide state. It, it's a question of um, sharing what we have in excess with people who are in need. And it has to be organized worldwide. So we're talking about nations sharing, not yes. people individually. Yeah. Well, right, and one good. thing doesn't exclude the other. Uh, obviously, uh, there are lots of people who do genuine good work by sharing all sorts of things. Sure. But to come to a solution to res resolve this crisis, we need to um, share worldwide. I think we have a video that we'd like to show about uh, the inequality that you're talking about, Alexander. The fact that there is so much wealth uh, concentrated in the hands of a few, yes. comparatively speaking. People are talking a lot about inequality these days, about the fact that the richest 1% have so much more than everybody else. But most of the focus seems to be on the United States, and it strikes me that the same story needs to be told about global inequality too. So I did some research, and this is what I found from reliable sources like the UN. It turns out, that while the U.S. is totally out of whack, things are actually way worse for the planet as a whole. Let's start with this graph. 
a perfectly even distribution of wealth among all living people, with everyone divided into five equal groups. Now, let's show how much each group actually has. Shocking, right? 80% of the world's people barely have any wealth. It's hard to even see them on the chart. Meanwhile, the richest 2%, they have more wealth than the rest of the world. Let's look at this chart another way. Let's take the whole world's population, all 7 billion of us, and reduce it to just a representative 100 individuals. Here they are, poorest people on the left, richest people on the right. Now let's show how the world's total wealth, roughly $223 trillion, is distributed. The vast majority have practically nothing, nothing with which to educate their children, nothing with which to pay for basic medicines, while the richest 1%, they've accumulated 43% of our world's wealth. The bottom 80%, meanwhile, and that's 8 out of every 10 people, have just 6% between them. But even this doesn't really show how extreme things have become. The richest 300 people on Earth have the same wealth as the poorest 3 billion. So the number of people it takes to fill a mid-sized commercial aircraft have more wealth than the populations of India, China, the US, and Brazil combined. Wow, great video. So we're talking about nations sharing, not about individual people. Any, any sharing that individuals wanna do would be voluntary. And they're not gonna be forced to share. So that's a really good point. Thank you. Except, of course, we could say that the individual, too, has to uh, play his part, her part. And perhaps it's also a time for us all throughout the world now, given the time that we have uh, with the lockdown and so on, to really think about our priorities and think about whether we, th we can possibly live slightly more simply, perhaps not be driven so much by a sense of entitlement and... Um, greed or um, we're used to luxury, perhaps it's time for us to start thinking about bringing our expectations and our demands on the planet down a notch or two so that we live more simply. And I think that's up to each individual, as you said, Dick, uh, up to each person. But um, no one will be forced to do this, of course. But just think about how the world will be if such a um, system is implemented, if we can make it possible, because you can see the amount of tension, the amount of chaos, which uh, is a direct result of this enormous imbalance and the polarization of our world at the moment. And I think that's what we all are experiencing at the moment, the sense of tension rising because of the polarization and people really being pulled um, in, in several directions. And you see um, the, the older conservative, and when I say older, I'm not talking about age, but uh, a, a mindset that holds on to the old and wants, wants to have what it's earned and it's worked hard for its money. That's true. But there's also the new and people are saying, well, no, perhaps it would be better if we step, bring things down a bit, not demand so much from life because there's so much entitlement going on. Let's bring it down. Let's live more simply so that there's enough for all. And there is enough for all. Apparently, there is um, all there are all the resources necessary to feed everyone on our planet. The problem is distribution. And going along with that, of course, is infrastructure and all sorts of things. But we must think beyond our national borders, as we've just heard. It's very important to get away from the nationalist and narrow sense of ourselves. As you're saying, Felicity, when you talk about the need for us to also make an individual effort, I think that ties in with the fact that if we're talking about sharing on a global level between nations, this will require that our governments uh, want to do this and are willing to do this. And we know that governments usually act in response to what we would call maybe the will of the people or popular opinion or uh, what they perceive to be uh, the voters' desires um, and, and to please the voters. So there is also an aspect of that, that we have to be ready to make those wishes known to our governments. Uh, 
uh, because they probably won't do it unless we do. And uh, when that Vizio was showing and we were looking at the amount of wealth that the 1%, the richest 1% own, what came to mind was offshore uh, tax havens and that type of thing. And so of course we know that there's an incredible amount of wealth uh, secreted away in these kinds of places. And all of that also has to be brought into play. That's part of it. I was just looking up um, recently and uh, preparing for today's conversation with, and um, I'm struck by the fact that um, people who were billionaires um, in 2020, they almost, I, I'll just read it because I have it here. The, the figures are so startling, I can't, uh, I can't uh, memorize them, but the world's billionaires are worth an estimated 11.4 trillion and uh, they became richer um, collectively uh, from, yes, the, there are 2,200 billion plus, give or take, <laughs> billionaires in the world, and they have collectively become richer by 1.9 trillion in 2020. Wow. wow. This is staggering. And then I think, uh, Sabine, you in some previous conversation mentioned uh, about what it would take to um let's say put to rights the problem of hunger throughout the world that's and right well, there are figures for that it's been estimated at about 330 billion dollars uh, which it sounds like a big number but it really isn't and one of the other figures you can look at to put it in perspective is how much globally we spend on war and on weaponry armaments all of that that estimate is almost uh, 2,000 billion, 1,917 billion dollars. So you can see we're spending more than six times as much uh, as it would cost to end world hunger. We're spending that on war, basically. Uh, so it's clearly in our hands. Uh, it's, we don't lack uh, resources, not at all. It's so the money for this is available? Well, absolutely. We, we could simply stop uh, spending money on producing arms. Sure. And yeah, I think sure. it would it's be- It's a matter of priorities, isn't it? It is, absolutely. But we've also found uh, when I was doing some research for this show, uh, I decided that I wanted to know how much would it cost to end world hunger. And so I started typing in the search bar uh, of Google how much would it cost? I got to the word cost and a list of suggestions came up. And the first one in the list was to end world hunger. And I thought, well, is that really the most uh, frequently asked question or is it just because of my own previous uh, web searches? So I asked friends and family to do the same search and every single one came up with the same experience that as they typed in, how much would it cost to what came up was end world hunger. So what that tells me is there is a great desire uh, among people for this problem to be solved. People want to end world hunger. They, they're thinking about it. They're asking questions about it. So we're definitely on that track. Very interesting. And the ageless wisdom, the masters tell us that it will probably be um, accomplished through the United Nations, setting up a separate agency to take an inventory of each country's needs and an inventory of each country's production. And then it'd be very simple uh, after that to just have those with excess share the excess with the nations that need that particular product uh, or item and that it can be done in a very organized and very peaceful and very cooperative way. So sharing is one of the keys to attaining peace. Now, Alexander, um, I was gonna ask you, how do you define spirituality? I'd like to ask both of you and Felicity this. Well, one of the um, most essential um, statements, I would say, of, of the ageless wisdom teachings is that spirituality is really uh, not just something that's up there. It's not just something uh, we can aspire to. That is part of reality, but it is also 
um, based in life. And we are all part of, of reality and reality is spiritual in the sense that we are all interconnected. And um, many people think of spirituality in religious terms, which is true. And, and the different religions have brought forward all these spiritual principles, which are still relevant today. Uh, but it's not just religion. It, it also has to do with uh, um, economics. I mean, that is becoming more and more important uh, in, in this world crisis. Um, spirituality is um, connected to politics because politics is about uh, implementing the will of the people and we are at a crossroads, we are facing a, the most important choice in known history. And it also, uh, it, it is also stated that um, all the other fields of, of human endeavor, such as science, art, uh, technology, um, education, those are all integral part of, of what spirituality really is. So it, it is more of a synthetic um, view of spirituality. It's not just um, something we aspire to through prayer or meditation, but it's also something we are here to put into practice through service of our fellow human beings and the planet as a whole. You know what, what seems to me to be growing, uh, a growing realization with, I think, millions of people now, is the sense not only of, you touched on religion, so let's just, uh, just to, to uh, look at it from another point of view. Um, people, I think, are beginning to have more of a sense of themselves as divine, more of a, an experience of themselves as souls, Whatever, however that whatever that means to them and so the idea of god in us is growing and taking hold so that the the old idea if i may but, but still correct and valid idea of god beyond us god transcendent is also there but there is a sense now that we are learning and i think through our experience because more and more people are looking into an all a different way of looking at life a different way of looking at themselves it's a sort of redefining what a human being is and while that's happening we're having a greater it's a growing sense and it's really an experience rather than just the theory of ah somehow in some way there's something more to us, more to human beings than simply the everyday person. And that is probably at the basis of the sense of the need to share and change all sorts of things. And also this the broadening of our definition of spirituality so that we say, ah, I have to be spiritual in the way or I have to live according to myself as this being that I know I am in my politics, in my economics, in the way I deal with the planet and so on. So this set, the growing sense of ourselves is quite different to the way we described ourselves for the last 2000 years, is feeding into our politics, our economics and so on. And I think a big part of that is, is self-respect, um, a feeling of that we are worth something. Uh, yes. Therefore, we need to demand things. Uh, movements such as Me Too or Black Lives Matter, what we see there are people saying, this isn't right because I and we, uh, we deserve something more. Uh, we, we are inherently worth something more than this. Uh, and, and I think globally, as that grows and as we see people demanding rights and freedoms that previously they put up with not having, uh, that's where the big motor of change comes from. 
Yeah. And we know, of course, that we have in the United Nations basic principles enunciated in the principles, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have in uh, Article 25 exactly that, what you've just said. Isn't that right, Sabina? The need for, and here it is, everyone has the right to a standard of living. And it's simply because you are a human being and you're in life, everyone has these needs. That's right. And it makes me think of uh, what I saw often when I lived in Spain, where there's a lot of irregular immigration with people coming across the Mediterranean from Asia and Africa. And many NGOs there work to help people who arrive from these countries and don't have any resources. You would see graffiti on the walls saying, uh, no human being is illegal. Uh, and it's exactly what you're saying, that all of us have these rights in, innately, inherently, because we exist, because we are. And those are the first four priorities of Maitreya, as we know. Food for everyone, health care for everyone, housing for everyone, education for everyone along the lines of their interest. And it's right there in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The United Nations put this out in 19... 48, and we're still working on it. But there it is right there. Food, clothing, housing, health care, social services, the right to unemployment and sickness, and so on. So these are human rights. And the more we come to understand that, and the masters come to help us understand that, the more we can move in that direction as a human race and start, like I said earlier, start taking better care of ourselves. Now, um, how is the Brandt Report of the 1980s relevant today, Alexander? Um, this perhaps is a good example of, of how uh, Maitreya and his brothers work. In the late 70s, there was a, a growing awareness in parts of the world that we were moving in a situation with too much inequality between the rich and the poor. That was already becoming quite visible. And also there were more and more concerns about the environment, about the rights of women, uh, civil rights, etc., etc. And um, in uh, the late 70s, Maitreya, the world teacher, according to Benjamin Krem's information, contacted then um, Billy Blunt. Billy Blunt was, was well known because he is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And um, Maitreya asked Willy Blunt to form a commission, a commission under the UN to um, do research and work together with people from different countries, both from the developed world and from the developing world, um, leaders from uh, different political parties and, and opinions and try to um, come to an understanding of the whole situation in the world. Um, so what they did was do research on, for instance, uh, the hunger problem we, we've already been talking about, but also the fact that uh, the vast majority of, of our resources are used by the wealthy part of the world, um, the financial systems in the world, the trade agreements, and it was, it was um, they brought forward two reports. The first one was in 1980, and uh, they made specific proposals to address the, the growing inequality in the world. And actually um, what it amounted to was uh, what we were already uh, discussing, um, na nation sharing produce, their resources, uh, creating uh, more balanced, more even trade worldwide. They will also um, put forward proposals concerning the environment uh, and the rights of, of people everywhere. Unfortunately, proposals were not accepted uh, by the, the Western world, uh, uh, the Reagan administration and the Thatcher government in particular. I think you can say that had these proposals been accepted at the time, we would be in a totally different situation right now. And we would not be in the crisis as it exists today. 
Um, so this this was uh, in, in 1980, the first report was published and it stated that, uh, that the, uh, the report was really about peace and that peace is more than the absence of war. That already at that time, there was a growing awareness that uh, economic injustice and the environment and uh, also terrorism were uh, concerns which need to be needed to be addressed and this was in 1980 so that's the way uh, Maitreya and his group work they they contact people they inspire people and they uh, try to bring forward uh, proposals but it's up to us what we do with it so we really have a blueprint for a right relationship, don't we? Yes. <laughs> we just haven't used it. That's so right. I, I'm, I'm suspecting this will be re revived and brought back to life um, as we start to get a better handle on, on how to take care of our world and take care of each other. A lot has changed uh, over the past 40 years, but Good yes, in, in, in essence, uh, I, I think I'm quite sure that, that the proposals will stand. Sabina? I'd like to just bring up that uh, in 1963, in his letter from uh, Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King also uh, pointed out the difference between a peace that's simply the absence of uh, tension in the sense of, of conflict and mm -hmm. that's based on a real justice. And, and I think that's a very important point because uh, simply causing people to stop killing each other doesn't create real peace. It's, it's simply an absence of violence. Uh, but what we're talking about when we talk about peace, we're talking about a peace that would be full of justice. So there would be no cause for wanting to fight or no feeling of being dispossessed, no feeling of having been done wrong. And I think that's really the problem right now in the world is that there is so much of this, yeah. uh, it's so widespread uh, and it's, it creates in people and, you know, Felicity, you were talking about that innate reality of justice or feeling of fairness, what we all have inside of us. So of course, when people see their land taken away, when they see themselves unable to provide for their families, uh, this is going to have a consequence. It, it doesn't just it evaporate, it's a real consequence inside people. So Sabina, how do the masters and the ageless wisdom suggest that we resolve conflict? Well, their recommendation is very simple. It almost sounds too simple, uh, but, but they say what we need to do is talk, talk to each other heart to heart. We have to have open hearts towards each other, sincerity. We have to be really genuinely wanting to resolve the conflict. And I think we can all agree anytime when we've experienced conflict in our own lives, if, the, if there's a genuine will and desire to resolve that conflict among the parties involved, then they do find a solution. Uh, I think it comes down to really the will to do it. Uh, and as long as you're holding on to something else, you think something else is more important, um, you won't be able to, but that's their advice, heart to heart communication. And Maitreya himself has said, in fact, that uh, awareness arises out of communication. So it's important to communicate, it's necessary. It's a vital part of who we are. The more we do it, the more awareness we begin to have. And we all have the experience that we might be unsure about something and then we start talking about it or listening to someone talk about it. And in the process, clarity comes. Um, and that's awareness. That's the awareness that arises out of communication. And the ageless wisdom tells us this can in part be done through the General Assembly of the United Nations, which should be a, a forum for nations to present their issues to the rest of the world and then talk about it, as you said, heart to heart, sincerely with each other to try to resolve the issue so that we don't have to have the wars and, and, um, and so on around the world. So the United Nations, the masters see the United Nations playing a, 
a bigger role. There'll be no one world government. We're not talking about that. Every nation is important. Every nation has its own personality and contributes to the whole. But the United Nations can be a representative of all those countries and give us a place to talk things over, especially if the Security Council is removed and the veto powers are taken away. Yeah. Uh, the General Assembly will really be able to blossom and come into its own. Um, I think it's time to take some questions and bring Haley in, but I just want to give a quick snapshot of our sharing and justice and peace to say this, that the Ageless Wisdom tells us that once we share globally so that no one is desperate to survive anymore, that that creates justice. And justice creates trust. And when people and countries trust each other, there's peace. Not only peace, but cooperative, a cooperative sense of humanity being one and nations being part of one world. And so that's how sharing and justice can lead to peace is by establishing trust worldwide between peoples and between countries. Goodwill, aren't you? Goodwill. Yes, yes it is. It's a matter of will and Maitreya comes to teach us the will of God and the purpose behind that will, which is really, I mean, we've all been wondering why we're here and we're about to find out in no uncertainty why we're here, what the will of God is. So let's bring in Haley Moore and see what she has for us. Haley, what questions do you have for us? Hi, um, thank you to everybody for your questions and comments. Um, I'm gonna try and get to as many as we can. Um, there's been several regarding um, the mechanisms for sharing um, and how can one resolve this crisis by worldwide sharing. Um, another one says, um, will BATA feature more prominently? Will the UN be, become more relevant? Um, what mechanisms do you see as being an instrument in the global scheme of sharing? Well, we talked a little bit about how the United Nations would have, would, is apparently going to have a separate agency set up to take inventories and help with the distribution. But as for the rest of it, um, Felicity, do you want to get us started? Yes, and Dick, you, you, you said so well what I was just going to say just before you brought Haley in. Um, and indeed, it is because we're going to, we, hopefully, we need to start establishing a global system in which everyone can participate so that you have a basis of trust because without sharing, and that, that's the brilliance of, of this um, advice that we've been given. If you share, then you begin to create a sense of trust and uh, respect and tolerance among nations. And nations can then perhaps let their guard down. They don't perhaps have to spend so much on their uh, military budgets and can perhaps focus more on trying to serve the needs of their people because that is what a government is supposed to do. It is supposed to beautify to to uh, and I, I i read this just the other day it's supposed to beautify to create conditions in which its citizens can all flourish and uh, what you've just said about the united nations where each country will have its place and be respected and not feel marginalized and uh, excluded from the world family um, and it will be through the united nations but also through the increasing pressure brought to bear on our governments and our leaders by the voice of the people. People Absolutely. throughout the world are, and this is one of the mechanisms for change, and we have to see it as such. This is one of the ways in which we will make the changes that are required to bring about a just and sane society for all of us, and that is for all 7.8 billion of us. We need to see ourselves as actors active in the possibility of making change. And that has to happen regularly. Now I know that uh, the lockdown and so on has to a large extent uh, limited the possibility, but people are still demonstrating where, where, it's, where it's felt to be important. And this will continue and people can also make their voices heard in all sorts of ways. 
as for example, through the media and so on. So this is one of the mechanisms. And then of course, to the United Nations and through our leaders and voting in leaders that we respect and who we know will respect the wishes of the people. And Maitreya has said that no one is too old or too young or too rich or too poor to participate and to contribute. We can all contribute to the betterment of life on this planet. Thank you. Haley, do you have another one? Wait, I'd like to jump in for a second about uh, what you were talking about there, Felicity, sure. about the need for us to recognize that it's our pressure on our governments that is one of the engines of change. Um, there has been research done by the Pew Center in the United States on how the different generations view government. And what they found is starting with the baby boom and going through the generation until the most recent, the one they're calling Generation Z or the Zoomers, um, those who, who were born in this century, what they're finding is there's a steady increase in the proportion of people who feel they want an activist government meaning a government who's going to make changes in the directions of social justice. It's now 70% of that latest generation want an activist government compared to earlier with the boomers, for example, it was 45%. So there's a real trend in that direction. And you can see it, as you were saying, Felicity, people are still going out and demonstrating in spite of the, the pandemic right now. Each in very many countries. To meet the needs of its time, doesn't it? Yes, Alexander. And in many, many countries. I mean, look at Middle Eastern countries, look at Latin America, look at India, even China, uh, Russia. I mean, uh, not a day goes by without a major demonstration, you know, in all these parts of the world. And especially young people, they yes. are demanding a future. Yes. They know, they feel their future, which is the future of humanity, is at stake. I've been most impressed by the young people in Thailand saying that they don't have a future if the system stays the way it is. And now more recently in Myanmar, people demonstrate, yes. in spite of that terrible dictatorship. Yes. It's incredible. Okay, Haley, do you have another one? Yes. Um, so this comment is talking about um, it says, this sounds like a different kind of economics, a sharing economics, but won't that need a sea change in our core values and ideas, moving from competitive relationship to cooperative ones, but competition has become so deeply embedded. Is this possible? Want to start us off on that, Felicity? Well, our whole premise is, of course, that um, we have to start cooperating and that more and more people are seeing the, not just simply the need for it, but the, it's, a, it's a, a sort of a, a response now that is an, a spontaneous response. We see that cooperation is the way forward, that competition is actually one of the bases one of the problems uh, at, at the heart of our problems in the world. And what all of us long for, we all long for uh, to be able to get on with people on a very simple level and to be able to get on with our lives, to flourish, to explore, to investigate ideas and so on. And competition is at the heart of some of the most terrible and really stubborn problems that we've dealt with over the, if the last 70 years and more. In fact, I think that you could say that the, the issue of competition and commercialization go together so that we are, all, we are driven into competition in a way. We think that's what our lives are about. We think that we have to uh, succeed. We have to be ambitious. We have to elbow other people out of the way. And yet that is precisely the problem. And if we can put that aside and begin to look more cooperatively, more collectively at what serves the needs of humanity as a whole. And that comes right back to you as an, as an individual. It is possible. Um, and if you see that the um, competition and commercialization has actually is part of the polarization that has allowed greed to grow and become the norm. We accept that there's a tax 
a tax regime for one for one group of people and a tax uh, situation for others. We know that people who have billions are able to get off paying less tax than people who have almost nothing. How is it possible to have this divided world, which is based on competition? And again, this is, goes back to the sense of we don't know ourselves. And if we're talking about Maitreya and the masters, they have said that humanity must see itself as one and know itself to be part of every of all others. And when you begin to have that as the basis, the rest follows, as we've all said. Yes, we're going from a time of cooperation to a time, a time of competition to a time of cooperation. That's it. We're going from a time of me to a time of us working together in cooperation. And Alexander, that takes a new awareness of a conscious awareness of ourselves and others, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, to put it very simply, it's not just important to become more aware of ourselves as divine beings, uh, beings who have a potential which we, we sense. We're not completely aware of it, but we do sense it. It is equally important to recognize that in each other. We are essentially the same. We all share this divinity. We all share this potential. And, uh, and we are here to, to bring it into, in, into practice, to, to, to manifest it, to demonstrate it, to realize it. Uh, life after life, um, as we evolve. So that, that is essential. And there's also a practical side to it. Right now, we are suffering under a, what you could call a totalitarian economic system. It's the totalitarian form of the capitalist idea of economy. We will find that, that the masters of wisdom and Maitreya are very practical. They are not going to come through and, and order us or, or encourage us to, to bring about a total revolution. No, they will advise us to look at what works and what doesn't work. And their advice is, when it comes to the economy, is it should be about two thirds, 70% uh, based on, on socialist principles. So collectively, for instance, healthcare, education, energy, that should all be structured, organized collectively so that everybody can have access to all of that. And there's also room for capitalism, free enterprise. That's also important. We will find that uh, the masters of wisdom are not dogmatic, quite the contrary. I think uh, history has proven that totalitarian systems do not work, whether it's religious or political, and certainly these days, our economic system is too totalitarian. It's all based on market forces, free enterprise for the privileged few, while the rest are suffering. Yes, totalitarianism is not self-supportive. It, it, it won't last. Okay, Haley, do you have another one? So several people are talking about the idea that uh, the pandemic is forcing us to look at the idea of sharing and how the pandemic is going to shape uh, our moving forward. Yeah, it's something I uh, feel personally concerned with uh, as a Canadian because Canada has been in the news recently uh, because they were double dipping in terms of vaccines. Uh, Canada took their share of the COVAX scheme of vaccines, which is a scheme set up by the World Health Organization to make sure that every country in the world has access to vaccines. It's a method of distribution for all countries. So every country has a right to a particular share under that scheme. So Canada took their share, but then in addition, because it's a wealthy country, uh, Canada also made deals privately with uh, vaccine manufacturers to acquire more doses. In the process, uh, that drove the prices up of the vaccines. 
And so they've been accused, and rightly so, of double dipping and, and of not playing fair. And so what I think, when you, when you talk about the, the pandemic and how it will or will not push us closer to sharing on a global level, I think what we're seeing is there's a heightened awareness of the fact that there are these imbalances. And it's not just an imbalance in the sense that one country has more wealth than another, but that imbalance in wealth is an imbalance in power, uh, an imbalance in their, their effect on the whole system. So what we're seeing is that people are aware of it, they're observing it, and there's an outcry, and there's a response, a reaction, and people are saying, this isn't fair, this isn't right. Uh, and I also feel that social media is a big part of it because people use that a lot to communicate all the time and tell each other what's happening, who's doing what. Uh, people get shamed there publicly. Uh, people get brought down on social media. Uh, and so as much as we might not like social media for many of its destructive uh, qualities, it's also being used very often uh, to shine a spotlight on wrongdoing or on what's perceived as an unfair advantage. So I do think that the pandemic is going to bring us closer to sharing because it's making us aware of all the ways in which right now we don't share. You know, just that it puts it into a context of life and death and that makes everybody pay much more attention. I was thinking that it is absolutely essential that we all wake up now because this is one of the greatest wake up calls we've had since the last world war. We are faced, as you just said it, life and death, and it is showing up all the flaws and the weaknesses. So we cannot go back to narrow nationalism. We can, be, because if there's one thing you learn from the coronavirus, it is that unless everyone is safe, no one is safe. This is, goes back to the same thing that the Masters and Maitreya say, how can there be two worlds when the world is one? How can you allow millions to starve? How can you allow the suffering of your fellow men when you have the means to do something about it? And we know through the media and we, we are aware of the fact of what is happening. And this is a, a time which is absolutely crucial. We need to grab this opportunity and transform ourselves and everything in our society so that we, we, we create a system of global social justice for every single person. You, we cannot say that um, one country is safe because it has more money and can buy the vaccines, sooner or later, it will come back. This is a question of, uh, and Brunt used the, this principle very uh, cleverly in, in the report. They talked about um, simple um, intelligence, slightly clever self-interest as well. So yeah. use, use that as well, if necessary, but yes. think about, self-interest your own people but think about the world in general and see it as a whole and i often find that it's quite useful if you um, in your imagination just step off the planet for a minute and look at the planet as we saw it for the first time when it was our planet was seen photographed from the moon for the first time and we all saw this fragile one system this powerful but fragile one system to which we all belonged and we could all identify with. And I think we need to do this in imagination again, step back, see our planet, see what it's suffering and see what needs to be done. The man who was responsible for discovering the polio vaccine, his name was Salk, I believe, S-A-L-K. He was right. asked whether he'd like to take a patent out on it because it was uh, earn him billions. And he said, very simply, why would you want to take a patent out on the sun? In other words, it is as simple as that. It belongs to all. And everything on our planet is there for all. And there is, as we've said before, there is enough for all. So this, this notion of national competition and leaving others to die, I heard 
the governor of a, uh, of a part of Bosnia just recently saying that he was willing to allow the people to stay in the snow uh, and be locked out and not be able to come in. And these are hundreds of, I don't know how many, people who are destitute and desperate and they have traveled sometimes across the Sahara, across many African countries to get to North Africa, to take a, a leaky boat to try to get to Italy or wherever it is and, and then cross the rest of Europe. And they were prepared to let, let them die because, well, that was it. These, these people weren't worth it. This cannot be. And this is the same attitude that we see in terms of the vaccines and so on. And I know some people are against the vaccines. That's their, their right, but they should be available to all who need them and who want them. Nobody's saying they should have them. And nobody's saying they should be forced to have them, but everyone should have the ability and access to all of the resources, including medical resources. And that's about justice again, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Haley, have we got another one? Yes. Um, this one is says, it seems to me that sharing globally will change, require a change of heart, a change of consciousness among people everywhere. Uh, how will this change of consciousness, change of heart happen? And how will Maitreya and the masters help this change to happen? How do we change consciousness, Savina? Well, within your own self, it happens. Well, the truth is it's happening all the time. Uh, the evolution of our consciousness, the changes in our consciousness, that's a, an intrinsic part of life. But how do you make it happen faster uh, within your own self by wanting it to? Uh, I don't think you can force other people. You can't change others' consciousness. Uh, but what you can do is you can throw light on issues. You can give more information. You can share a perspective. You can change someone's point of view by showing them something they may not have seen before. So again, I think communication, awareness, information, all of these are extremely vital. Um, that's usually how people's consciousness changes is through greater understanding. And when we think of the word enlightenment, uh, it has light in it. So it's shining light on something, uh, making it clearer. And here again, the internet is a fantastic tool because people can seek information, they can throw light on issues and gain greater understanding. Uh, a lot of people may be stuck in a particular mindset that is uh, uncaring towards their fellow man through a lack of knowledge, through a lack of awareness. Uh, and that's simply because there's a lack of information. So I think that's one of the main tools. Of course, you can also meditate and gain greater connection with your soul. That's a, that's a very powerful tool, but you can't force people to do things. Uh, in many ways, it is already happening. There is a, a change of awareness going on in the world. And you know, we were talking about demonstrations and, and all these people uh, right now who are even willing to give up their lives for the sake of, of, of their brothers and sisters. It's not that we first need to change con consciousness and then things are going to change. No, it, it is simultaneous. It is happening as we speak. I'd also yeah. like to say that Maitreya himself, of course, is in the world and although not known yet as Maitreya, not known yet as, uh, as his true identity, um, because we, and this is, I'm going back to the question of change of heart, because we need to long for the world, the kind for the, and respond to and relate to the kind of ideas that he is putting forward. And these are the ideas of sharing, of justice, of right relations with him, with, with all, with all of humanity. And um, the also is here as the embodiment of a particular quality, an actual energy. He is the embodiment and he anchors it on our planet. He is the embodiment of a particular energy and that is the energy which people call the Christ consciousness or the energy of love. 
Now, when Maitreya sends that energy out into the world, as he does at particular times, and, uh, and he and the masters work in this way, stimulating, uh, encouraging and stimulating our aspiration, uh, galvanizing us to, to take action on the part of our fellow men, to, to make connection with our souls, as Sabina mentioned, to live in particular way, as, as uh, Alexander has mentioned, so that this consciousness grows. Because what we're talking about is the growth of consciousness. And that consciousness is the growth of a sense of ourselves as being divine and being connected with each other. And this sense, plus the energies that are flooding into the world now, and the possibility, the very strong possibility of a financial collapse, which will bring us to our senses, all of these combined, Maitreya's energies, the love of Maitreya, the energies that are pouring in, our sense of ourselves as souls, the possibility of an economic collapse, a financial collapse, which would really bring people up short and make us start thinking about our priorities and what we need to change. Um, all of these together, I believe, will come together if we grab the opportunity, but it means we need to be open to what is going on now. And that is the situation we are in in 2020 and in 2021. We're faced with this. We need to take this opportunity and grow into what we need to be, which is part of a, a collective moving forward, changing its consciousness into an amazing world that's waiting for us. We have a society and a global, a global civilization waiting for us that we've never seen before, which will allow all of us to flourish, to be our beautiful, real, best, highest selves, to grow into a sense of ourselves as creative beings in every sense of that word. I don't just mean making nice things or making a painting. I mean creativity in, across the board. This is... The, what is waiting for us, but we have to grab it now. The Ageless Wisdom tells us that the royal road to spiritual growth, to growth in consciousness, is meditation. Meditation isn't for everybody, but meditation and service. And it also says that the nature of the soul is to serve. So once we get in touch with who we really are, that we're a living soul, we look for ways to serve, to help other people. And I'm afraid it looks like we've run out of time. So what we've been talking about, this is important. What we've been talking about is not something mystical. The problems are real. The solutions are real. The masters are real people. And we are all sacred people, all brothers and sisters of the one humanity. I want to thank our panel, Felicity and Sabina and Alexander. I also want to thank Haley and our technical staff for being with us today. And we want to thank all of you for tuning in and joining us today. Be looking for an announcement of the next webinar, webinar in our series within the next few weeks. And that's it for today. Goodbye. <laughs>